Right, uh, so I'm going to try and talk for about half an hour. There's 45 minutes for the talk. I know people will have questions, so I'm going to try and make sure we have time for questions. And I know that John Ford is here, whose uh, family have been accessing this medicine in the US, who will also say a few words. Uh, so I saw the first slide here, this is the title of a talk I've given several times uh, to different groups. Um, in fact, this is the first time I've given it to uh, a, a, a general audience. Usually it's to, to doctors who want to know what's happening in this field. And I thought it'd be useful to compare uh, the emergence of the interest in the cannabis plant with uh, another uh, medi medication that's derived from a plant that we're increasingly using less of, okay? And so on the, do I have a pointer here actually? No pointer, okay. So, so on this side here, uh, you can see this is a bottle of uh, cannabis indica oil that's from the turn of the century when cannabis was more widely used for medicinal use. And this plant here, does anybody recognize it? Any, any uh, gardeners here? Does this, this is grown in Ireland. No. Valerian. Anybody have that in their garden? So this is common valerian, it's known as. And this is a, a quote from John Herald's book from 1610. Excellent for those burdened and for such as to be troubled with croup and other like convulsions. So this plant that's grown in Irish gardens has been used for the treatment of epilepsy for centuries. And what happened was that uh, it became this drug, sodium valproate or epilim. Many of you will know it. You'll recognize it there. So this is just an example of another medicine that was derived from a plant. So I suppose I'm getting across the point that deriving medicines from plants is not an unusual phenomenon. That is the history of, of pharmacology, I suppose, is about finding things in nature that will help treat our, our various ailments. And um, this this was, I suppose, rediscovered in the late 19th century, 1881, as being useful for uh, convulsions, but it didn't get a license for treatment until the 1960s. Now, of course, many of you will be aware that, uh, and this is the way of things, that this is a very useful drug. Many of you will have uh, had been on this drug yourselves or had relatives uh, taking the drug um, but what's happened in the last number of years is there's been increasing concern about the taking of this drug in this particular group. So not in men, not in young uh, children, boys or girls, not in older women, but in, in this group of women who are of childbearing age. And what we found is now that there's a high risk of developing uh, fetal malformations associated with taking, taking this drug. Uh, and the reason I'm putting this slide up and to show you this uh, before I talk about the cannabis is again here's a you know rel you know here's a, here's a history of a of a of a drug that's come from a natural plant it has all those great characteristics but now it's taken us 50 60 years to realize there's actually problems with it and it's not it's not safe for everyone and um, what we know now is that the the ordinary risk the risk of having a child with a malformation and this is for people in the, in the audience or for the general public out there who don't have epilepsy and are not taking anti-epileptic drugs the risk for women is 2% of them will get a malformation. The risk overall from taking anti-epileptic drugs goes to about 6%, but epilim seems to confer a risk of about 40%. So there's a very, very high risk of getting uh, fetal malformations in, uh, if, if you're in that age group. And there's a big campaign uh, going on Europe-wide and in Ireland to try and get this message out. Um, that was a, a statement from the European Medicines Agency two years ago. Doctors are now advised not to prescribe epilim for epilepsy or bipolar disorder in pregnant women or in women who can become pregnant or in girls unless other treatment is not uh, available or not tolerated. Okay, so that's just an example of a you know natural developed product coming from a plant that you can grow in your garden, and it's taken us a long time to understand that there's problems with it, and, and it's not for everyone. But it's a spectacularly good drug also for other people. So let's move on to cannabis. This is the cannabis indica plant, and there are two main uh, varieties of cannabis uh, plant, the indica and the sativa. Um, and I have here uh, what's called a botanical description. So any, any botanists in the audience will appreciate. I think this is, uh, the language here is very, um, it's actually quite beautiful, the description of it. This is from William B. O'Shaughnessy, and I'll talk about him in a moment, from 1839. This is an Irishman who's been at the forefront of developing uh, the, the scientific study of, of uh, cannabis for um, medical uses. So cannabis sativa and indica are identical. Uh, we find that the plant is dioecious, which means there's both female and male forms, annual 
about three feet high, covered over with a fine pubescence. The stem is erect, branched, bright green, angular. Leaves alternate or opposite on long, weak petioles. Digitate, scabrous with linear, lanceolate, sharply serrated leaflets, tapering into a long, smooth, entire point. Stipules subulate, clusters of flowered auxiliary with subulate braces. Males lax and drooping. <laughs> Branched and leafless at the base. Females erect, simple and leafy at the base. So... So that's a wonderful description of what's called the botanical description. This guy was a, was a medical doctor. And again, just shows you how important botany and understanding of the role of plants in treatment was for doctors who <coughs> trained at that time. They, they were basically, you know, amateur botanists. Um, so what do we know about this? What's the modern understanding? And this is a very important slide because it uh, it's figures uh, later on in the discussion. So what we know is that uh, the cannabis, the plant, is made up of Lots and lots of chemicals which are called the cannabinoids, okay? The two main ones here on the left I'm going to talk about in detail. Okay, the two, the two I'm told everybody can see the slides, so we're not going to turn the lights off. Uh, the two here on the left I'm going to talk about in detail. I just want to point to the 400 other small doses of, you might call impurities, but these are natural impurities that occur in the plant itself. And they are unavoidably all, always part of uh, any extract that you get from the cannabis plant, okay? Uh, and we don't know uh, even a fraction of what all of these things do. It may be that some part of this is bad for you, some part of it's good for you. But the bottom line is all of the focus in terms of the chemical makeup of the cannab cannabinoids is on these two chemicals. One is CBD, which is known as cannabidiol. Um, and this is a form which is very high in the hemp uh, elements of cannabis. So if you go back 10,000 years, you'll find references to uh, uh, industrial production of hemp rope and sacks and bags. And so the CBD is a primary component of, of hemp rope and hemp sacks and hemp material. Okay. And that form we know does not make you high. So there's no psychoactive component in CBD. Um, as I said, it's fibrous actually. If you dry it out, you turn it into fibers and that's where the rope comes from. The other form, which is tetrahydrocannabidiol, is the form that makes you high. And this is the form that makes up most of the recreational use of cannabis worldwide. Okay, so as of today, there's 150 million people in the world using recreational cannabis. And there are uh, references going back, as I said, to China 10,000 years ago about the recreational use of cannabis. So what's very important here is the, that in each plant, there's a certain proportion of the CBD, and there's a certain portion of the THC. So if you want to go out and buy, uh, hang around some of the regions that I work in, <laughs> around Dublin 8, somebody will offer you a high-grade THC plant. And they'll, it'll probably have 50 or 60% THC in it. And that's the version. When people say, oh, this is really good stuff, what they mean is it has high levels of THC. <laughs> the, lower, the lower the THC, the less of the high you get. Okay, And that's going to be important. And I'll, I'll come, I'll, that'll come up again in discussions later on. Okay, so what, what do we know historically about epilepsy and, uh, and uh, cannabis? Well, we know that the, uh, there were references. This is the uh, Ibn al-Badri, who was a famous physician back in the 16th century, who wrote, the epileptic son of the caliph's chamberlain was treated with cannabis and it cured him completely, but he became an addict uh, who could not for a moment be without the drug. So I suppose that illustrates the two halves of this argument, you know, the question of, you know, are we putting people in danger of some kind of addiction with the drug? But obviously it has a useful uh, in the treatment of epilepsy. This is William O'Shaughnessy again, um, Irish man born in Limerick, went to work for the East India Company in the 19, 1830s. And when he, what he noticed was when he was traveling around uh, in the local locality in India, he noticed that local uh, doctors, local medicine men were using this, uh, this plant, which was known as ganja uh, locally, to treat various illnesses. And this is his first paper that he wrote on it. So this is known as the first uh, paper ever, scientific paper, about the medicinal use of cannabis. Um, and it was written in 18, uh, published in 1843 in the Provincial Medical Journal in London. And this is just from the, from, the, from the introduction. So the narcotic effects of hemp are popularly known in South Africa, South America, Turkey, Egypt, Asia, Minor, India, and adjacent territories of the Malays, Burme Burmese, and Siamese. In all these countries, hemp is used in various forms, by the dissipated and the depraved as a ready agent of pleasing intoxication. <coughs> However, that's my brackets, he, he, he wrote, in the popular medicine of these nations, we find it extensively employed for a multitude of affections, particularly those in which spasm or neuralgic pain are prominent symptoms. 
So you can see there again that illustration of that dual issue with this drug. You know, it's potential for uh, recreational use. It's um, um, and then obviously it's potential medicinal use. Um, bringing it up to date, then in the 1880s, William Gowers. Now he would be popularly known as so the father of modern epileptology. This man is his descriptions of epilepsy are the things we still use today, and he would have written textbooks on it. He says cannabis has been recommended for epilepsy by Russell Reynolds. Russell Reynolds was the Queen's doctor in 1861, as sometimes, though not very frequently useful, of small value as an adjunct to the bromide, which many of you will know was the first true anti-epileptic drug, but is sometimes considerable, of considerable service if given separately. So again, I wouldn't say that's a wholehearted <laughs> endorsement, but a qualified endorsement of cannabis use in epilepsy. By 1851, uh, various US states were adding cannabis uh, forms to their various dispensaries, so you could send your patients to the dispensary and get it. So uh, cannabis compounds were suggested for neuralgia, depression, muscle spasm, convulsive disorders. And then uh, the Ohio Medical Society said that it was uh, useful for infantile convulsions, epilepsy, and many other disorders. So by the end of the 19th century, there was wide-ranging use of various compounds of cannabis to treat various disorders, not just epileptic. Now, at the same time, and this is a hard slide to see, there was a movement going on, particularly in North America, but also worldwide, which was known as the temperance movement. And the temperance movement grew up really around alcohol. And uh, Benjamin Rush do this thing, which is called the Moral Thermometer. Uh, and he was one of the signatories of the US Declaration of Independence. And what the temperance movement felt was that, if you see at the top here, water, uh, milk, vinegar, uh, small amounts of beer, these are all consistent with health, happiness, serenity of mind, long life and etc. Generally good for you. And it includes small amounts of alcohol. A lot of that part people understand that temperance movement started off endorsing small amounts of alcohol. But then you get into the intemperance amount. Toddy, grog, flip, and some of these things, slings, bitters. Uh, these are all hard liquors. These are all fermented liquors as opposed to brew, you know, as opposed to wine, etc. And this was this was considered to be associated with vices like uh, uh, quarreling, fighting, lying, swearing, obscenity. So the temperance movement was growing in influence in the United States during the same period that cannabis was being used uh, for uh, medicinal use. And remember, in the 1860s, the average uh, American home was drinking four times the amount of hard liquor that it drinks now. I'm talking about whiskies and those kind of things. So there was a really big problem with domestic violence and uh, severe illness associated with alcohol. And that's why this movement grew up. And what's really fascinating is the role that women played in that because... Um, of course, women didn't have the vote by then. Universal <coughs> suffrage didn't come until the early 20th century. And it was one area where they felt they could get involved politically. And what you find is a wide range of women from all sides of the political spectrum came together in the women's temperance movement. Um, sorry, this is just a picture of the, the drunkard's progress. There he is, uh, step one, still fairly, uh, um, uh, fairly uh, you know, an, an upstanding member of society. And as he goes up the line here, he starts to deteriorate. Okay, but uh, so this is a, this is an article, uh, uh, sort of cartoon published in the Women's Temperance Movement. So they they became uh, uh, fierce advocates for uh, for the temperance movement and for reducing the amount of alcohol they're taking, for reducing domestic violence, and it became the start really of women's political movements, and that which led subsequently to universal suffrage. So it's a very important part of political history. Uh, and there's the Anti Saloon League, which is another uh, another version of the anti temperance movement. This, of course, led to what's known as the Volstead Act in 1919 in the US, which is known as Prohibition, a uh, very other interesting era in history where uh, more people started drinking after Prohibition than stopped, but they were doing it on the sly. And what was interesting was during this period between 1919 and 1933, when Prohibition was a national program across the US, um, I'm gonna, sorry, I'll get to that in a moment. This is actually just uh, Ireland's own temperance movement. This is Dublin City. I haven't picked out the Alexandra Hotel, but this is the Liffey here. These are all Dublin's greatest. These are all pubs in Dublin. You can see how many there were. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is a Salvation Army map of, uh, of Dublin, and it's the evils of Dublin. And up in the right-hand corner, then there's uh, lists of arrests for men and women. There's uh, arrests for drunkenness, males, 8,000, and females, 3,000. And look how many of them were discharged. Only 18... <laughs> They were discharged, so there were 11,000 convictions. So we had our own movement, of, uh, our own temperance movement, and this was part of a general European movement worldwide. 
So what happened was that along with prohibition uh, in the US for alcohol, of course, any other substance which caused any other sort of psychoactive component started coming under the remit. So heroin, cocaine, all other drugs, including cannabis, came under the remit of, no, we can't have this. Our society is, is rejecting anything which changes uh, one's thinking or in any way affects one's judgment. And so in uh, 1911, Massachusetts was the first state to, uh, to prohibit cannabis. And 1970, it took for the US Controlled Substance Act passing saying that marijuana had no accepted medical use. Uh, this is just an interesting... Uh, during the period of, of prohibition between 1919 and 1933, if you were wealthy enough and you were willing to pay, you could get a prescription from your doctor to get alcohol. So this is a liquor prescription stub. So name of patient, address, ailment for which is prescribed, any ailment you like. <laughs> and most famously in the UK, this is... Uh, a. So what prescription from Dr. Otto Pickhart? This is to certify that the post uh, that the post accident convalescence of the honorary Winston S. Churchill necessitates the use of alcoholic spirits, especially at meal times. The quantity is naturally indefinite, but at meal, the minimum requirement should be 250 cubic centimeters. So that's what happened. Uh, you know, at one end of society there was prohibition for everyone, but at a certain end of society, uh, people could get a prescription from a doctor who's willing to write it for them. <laughs> Now, bring us right up to date. What happened then in the 1990s? So very, very uh, quickly, um, with the rise on, uh, uh, and I think this is a very important movement, the rise, and a lot of you will be listening to this, knowing this story because of what you've read on the internet. The rise of the information superhighway, the rise in consumer rights, etc., have brought uh, back the idea that cannabis may have medicinal use into the consciousness. And in 1996, the Californian uh, state legislature passed uh, cannabis, uh, they legalise it for medicinal use only, not for recreational use. And as of 2015, there are 23 states in the United States now who have legalised cannabis for medicinal use. Only a few have legalised it completely for all forms of use, including Colorado, um, but mostly for medicinal use. So where does more recent interest then in epilepsy... Uh, so telephone survey of patients in the Canadian Territory for an epilepsy centre was done uh, back in 2004. There was also a case report... 45-year-old man with cerebral palsy and ba bad seizures had a significant reduction in seizures after marijuana. And then a further Facebook survey of 150 families now had a very small response rate, but of those who responded, 84% of them said they improved taking uh, cannabis. All hell broke loose then with the uh, broadcasting of this documentary. You can see it on YouTube. It's called Weed. It's hosted by Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who's the CNN uh, doctor. He's uh, by training a neurosurgeon. He got interested in this story. And it, it was about a young girl whose name is Charlotte Figgy. And Charlotte's mum and dad uh, were living in the east coast of the United States. Her dad was a soldier uh, in Afghanistan. His wife was at home with their young daughter who had this very severe disorder called Dravet syndrome. Dravet is a genetic disorder. Uh, it, there's probably somewhere in the region of 60 to 100 people in Ireland who have the disorder. They're not all identified. Um, but it was actually uh, discovered by another Charlotte, just by coincidence, Charlotte Dravé in Paris in the 1990s. And it's due to damage to a sodium channel uh, in the brain, a receptor in the brain. So unfortunately, these children get very severe form of epilepsy. Some of them have up to 300 seizures per month. They spend a lot of time in hospital and most of them are uh, have very poor quality of life because they're on so much medicine to control their seizures. And uh, Charlotte's dad, while in Afghanistan, said to his wife, please, I've researched this, go to Colorado and start to access some of this medication uh, in Colorado in the hope that it will help. This is Charlotte with her sister. This is just during one of her seizures. Her sister uh, was had her you know, doctor set out. And... So what happened was that they came across this group of brothers called the Stanley Brothers. The Stanley Brothers were making a form of cannabis which had, remember going back to our original slide, high in the hemp version, the CBD, the non-psychoactive version, very low in the THC version. So this, what they were saying to the people was, you don't, you don't take this if you want to get high, if you want to have recreational uh, effect of the drug, but if you want to have some medicinal value for you, this is the form you want. And they grew this special form uh, that they bred themselves, very high in CBD, and they gave it to Charlotte. And this is a video of her, I haven't got the video now, but this is her going from 300 seizures a month down to one a week and really transforming her life. And so the story of Charlotte Figgy was so dramatic that the Stanley Brothers called the version that they'd made for her Charlotte's Web. And that's uh, the version that's being used uh, for many kids in the US. 
Now, as a result of that, and again, I think a very important part of this is discussion about the, you know, the role of the consumer rights, uh, the, you know, the movement of the, the demand that patients are making to make this stuff available. If this is so dramatic, why can't we make it available? Then a group of experts got together and con- formed a consortium. Um, this is all of the uh, uh, hospitals and various academic centers that joined together. Oren Davinsky of New York is the, uh, is the leader of it. And they put together what's called the expanded access trial. The idea was to take kids with the worst forms of epilepsy and put them on this uh, low uh, THC, high CBD version. And what they found was that an English company called GW Health were making a version. So they didn't use Charlotte's Web, but they used a version very similar with very low THC, very high CBD. And they uh, gave it to to, uh, a group of children. So what we had is 137 patients. Um, This is from all these different uh, regions. 25 of them had Dravet's and the rest of them had some other version of severe epilepsy. Um, There were 22 with Lennox Gasto. Um, And of the 137, uh, most of them had more than three months of treatment. Some of them had up to 48 weeks of treatment. Uh, This is just the age range. The the, the average age was 10. The average weight was about 40 kilograms. There There were the same number of men and women. And the baseline convulsive rate, that means the number, there were at least 100 seizures per month was the average number of seizures at baseline. So this is a very, very severe cohort of patients. So what were the results? Well, first important result, sorry. We're going backwards. First important result that 9%, 1 in 10, more or less, their seizures went away. So very important figure. Not a miracle cure, but an important figure that one in 10 children were going to get a, a, a signal. Remember, these are the, the most severe form of epilepsy. Uh, of the others, somewhere between 30% and 60% had a, 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 what's called a 50% reduction in their seizures. So they went from 100 seizures down to 50. Okay, so it's very important to focus on those two figures. The first figure is about one in 10 children, seizures stopped for around 50%, somewhere between 30 and 60%, but let's say on average 50% of children then had a 50% reduction in their seizures. The seizures went from 100 down to 50. What happened to all the others? Well, it just didn't work. And very importantly, what this tells us is that this treatment is very similar to what we see in other medications. So every time a new drug comes along and a company is promoting this drug, we often see these figures. There's always a number of patients who go seizure-free, there's a number who get some value, and then there's a, another, a remainder who don't. So this is telling us that this fits very nicely into what we know about other drugs in epilepsy. Give you an example. This is Emily. Uh, She had a a, a condition called Dews syndrome, which is, uh, uh, as as of yet, unclear uh, genetic disorder. We don't know what the gene that causes Dews syndrome is. Um, She was three and a half years old when her seizure started. She's on 16, this ACD is anti-convulsant drugs, so 16 different drugs over her history. Not at at the same time, but over her history, she's tried so many different drugs. She had a course of high-dose steroids. She was on the ketogenic diet that you'll see. Um, What am I doing? (laughs) Anyway, she entered the trial on four anti-convulsant drugs. Uh, she had a vagal nerve stimulator. She was having over 20 seizures per day. So she was at the more severe end of the scale. So she's over the 300 seizures per month. And they got her this dog, Benji, who's a seizure dog. So some of you know this, you know, you, there's a place in Dundalk and train dogs to notice when they're having a seizure. And the family basically got this dog specially trained to know when Emily was going to have a seizure so that they could react and stop her falling, etc. But have, the same week that she got the dog, she went on the trial. We started taking the cannabis oil, and that's Benji, 236 days later, unemployed. <laughs> so what happened was she became seizure-free when she reached 10 milligrams per kilogram, uh, which is kind of a high dose. We talk, we might get to talk about the dosing in a minute. Um, she was titrated off her frisium or clobazam because of lethargy. She's been seizure-free for over a year, had a significant improvement in her cognitive abilities, and the family's view was they had their Emily back. And this is the retired <laughs> picture. So what about Ireland? Um, nearly finished now. Um, so we have a, a, a Drugs Act very similar to the one that was in the US in 1977, in which it was stated explicitly, there's no medicinal use permitted of cannabis or its extracts. Um, now, technically, the very pure form of CBD, the one that's in Charlotte's Web and the one that's in the GW Health Epidiolex version, <coughs> is not covered by this act because it doesn't have... It has only trace amounts of THC in it. So technically speaking, this is considered a foodstuff, okay? 
Um, in the UK, you can get buy this on in, in health food stores very easily as a food stuff, as a food supplement. It's not a controlled substance. Um, now, what that means, unfortunately, is though neither it is a, is it a medicinal product. Okay, it's not a medicine. It's not considered a medicine. Therefore, it can't be prescribed by a doctor. Your doctor could tell you go and take it, or somebody could advise you to take it, but they can't prescribe you. You could give a prescription to a patient now, they go to the chemist, the chemist say, what's this? I, this is not a medicine. It's not a, it's not a medicine. Go to the health food store and see if you can get it. Um, so this puts the whole question of what's the doctor uh, role in this, in, in providing this drug, when it's available. Okay, I'm just talking about the availability. So these, this is a page from Amazon.uk. There's uh, various forms. There's one form that's in a capsule. There's a form that's actually... Uh, is in a, in a herbal, herbal form. There's one that comes in drops. And you can order that and you can buy it online. You can get it sent to the parcel motel and you can start the drug. Equally, this is, this is actually Charlotte's Web. This is the version that Charlotte Figgy was given, was, was made by the Stanley Brothers. You can order it online. It can be imported legally into Ireland and you can buy it down Capel Street. Okay, so it's be absolutely clear that this is not a controlled substance. So long as you can guarantee the amount of the THC is very low in it, and it is available to take, but it cannot be prescribed because it's not a medicinal product. It's not made with the right regulatory uh, sort of framework for a, for a, for a pharmacy to, to include it. So just very simply, if, it was, if you go into a pharmacy and there's the, you know, the medicines bit at the end of the pharmacy where the guy in the white coat is and he's dispensing the prescriptions, it can't be kept there. It could be kept outside with the vitamin E tablets and the calcium supplements and the stuff that's not prescription but it can't be kept down there so your doctor can't write you a script for you to go down and get that okay now i know people have questions about that clarifications and if we get to it i'll, I'll explain more so my conclusion then medicinal use of cannabis extract is not a new idea i hope i've made that clear um after a century of prohibition doctors patients and scientists are rediscovering the value of this ancient drug it's not a miracle cure it works for some forms of epilepsy and some forms of cannabis have been proven to be good for some forms of epilepsy and particularly for the very difficult forms. So for instance, I don't know what it would do for someone with a fairly straightforward form of epilepsy. Let's say somebody was subject to five or six seizures a year, which many people are. They take their medicine, they're fine, but they don't like it, it's causing them side effects. Doctor, I wonder, can I, should I change the cannabis? I have no idea whether that's a good idea or not. In fact, I'd say if they're seizure-free on their drug, definitely don't change. Because I don't know what this drug does for more standard forms of epilepsy. Um, equally, doctor, you know, yeah, that form, the Epidiolex form, yeah, I know. But I, I've heard that there's other forms that have more THC in them, that, that they, they actually work. Because I'm in this group where my child has tried the Epidiolex, it hasn't worked can I take this other one? I have no idea because all of the data I have is around this form that's, that I've given you data on. And as a scientist and as a doctor, like I have a sacred duty not only to treat but also to keep you safe. When I write a prescription every day of the week, I write hundreds of them. You know, I, I, in the back of my mind is the Hippocratic Oath, first statement, first do no harm. I can't be causing harm. So I don't know whether these other forms with different levels of THC will work. I just don't know. Um, there will be trials, hopefully, in the future that will look at different levels of THC. And maybe there's going to be, for those people that failed the CBD version, maybe there will be trials telling us it's safe. But at the moment, I don't know how safe it is. If you consider using the drug, it should be considered in conjunction with doctor's advice. I think this is really important. It's very important that people aren't going out and getting this drug and taking it, not telling their doctor, because then we don't know where we stand. Now, you may tell me, oh, my doctor has told me he doesn't want to know about it. Or, you know, these are all very difficult questions that are very personal. But to me, the doctor-patient relationship is, is absolutely critical in this. Um, and, you know, you have to be working with your doctor because if they don't know what you're taking, it affects everything else that's going on. The legal issues around prescribing for doctors and dispensing for pharmacists and ingesting for patients, all of these need to be clarified. And I'm not an expert in them. I've started to learn about the export-import business, about the wholesaling business. I know things about this stuff that I never thought I'd need to know. But researching this, I've begun to learn about them. But I'm still, I, I can tell you this, it, it isn't clear. And I know that there's a bill before the Dáil, a private member's bill that's been raised before the Dáil, um, about medicinal use of cannabis. Um, there will be amendments to that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but it may clarify things for everyone, including doctors, about where the role of this drug in prescribing is. But at the moment we're still in a bit of limbo. 
If I was to give you a time scale on it, clarification, I would say within, hopefully within the next 12 months, it'll be clarified. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>